Well, welcome to episode six of Broadcast Booth, stories from inside the headsets of play-by-play. I'm Brian Jensen, your host for this series, and for those of you that are jumping in at episode six, quick uh, background on what we do here. It's conversations with some of the great play-by-play voices from around the country, all sports. We're trying to knock them out one by one and uh, get some of these great uh, um, adventures that take place behind the microphone. For those of you that are watching on uh, our YouTube channel, thanks for tuning in that way. If you are listening on a podcast, be sure to join our YouTube channel at some point. It's Broadcast Booth. Makes a lot of sense. If you are watching on YouTube and you'd like to pick these up on a podcast, you can do that just about anywhere that you subscribe. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, all that great stuff. It's available. And uh, if you do that, you're going to hear some of the some of the great voices that uh, have joined us so far and that will continue to join us here, uh, including the guest of the day today, and he is the great play-by-play voice of the Dallas Mavericks, Chuck Cooperstein. Welcome to the series. It is great to be with you, Brian. It's been a long time. It's good to see you. It has been a while, but, uh, you know, we do go back a few years, I'd say. Uh, we do. Way, way, way back, I think, actually. <laughs> in fact, I think there was a time that uh, that you and I – may have crossed paths a little bit in, in trying to figure out what we were going to do in our play-by-play careers. I know um, there was some talk about uh, you and I both in the Texas Tech situation. Uh, you went to the Dallas Mavericks and uh, have carved in a, a completely fabulous career there. What a great decision that turned out to be. Yeah, I've, I was never involved with Texas Tech. Uh, there, was, there was one Big 12 school that I was very much involved with, uh, about uh, 20 years or so ago, uh, but that didn't that didn't work out for uh, varied and sundry reasons. But uh, you know, as they always say, uh, things work out for a reason. And uh, you know, I, I may have had to wait a little longer than I really wanted to wait, or thought I'd have to wait uh, before I got a, the job that I really, really wanted. But uh, but I got it, and I'm thrilled with it. And I hope to be doing this for a really long time. Well, now the job is uh, it is fabulous. Uh, the the play by play voice, radio play by play voice of the Dallas Mavericks. Uh, for those of you that are listening on the podcast, we're showing an image of um, of Chuck in the uh, seat that he has held now for what is it, uh, 15, 16 seasons? Sixteen years. Just finished Six- the sixteenth year. Wow, sixteen years. Uh, behind the microphone, Brad Davis sitting alongside there, and I know you know we're recording this right in the middle of the NBA Finals, which I know you would uh, hope to be able to be, or the the conference finals right now. I, I know you'd hope to be there. Oh, absolutely. There was uh, no greater thrill than uh, what I went through, uh, you know, in 2011. Uh, you know, the, the picture's up there. And let's face it, Brian, I mean, uh, you know, in many ways we are historians and uh, we are recording history every time that we broadcast a game. We never know what's going to happen, uh, but we always hope that uh, our team ultimately will be the one that is the last one standing. And uh, the fact that I got to experience that, uh, be able to get a championship ring, uh, is uh, is something that uh, it was totally unforgettable. Uh, and just, you know, so much of that run uh, through 2011, you know, just can really recite by memory, uh, just you know, it just it automatically just happens. You know, snap your fingers this day, snap your fingers. You know, where were we this day? What happened in this game? And then uh, ultimately, that uh, that scene in Miami on June twelfth, uh, and really everything that happened after that. You know, the the celebration that night, uh, the the flyback the next day from Miami and the the water cannons uh, when we got to Love Field. Uh, the fact that uh, then a couple of days later you have the, the parade and you have the rally and there's 20,000 people in the in American Airlines Center going nuts. Um, you know, I, I was fortunate enough uh, that uh, Rick Carlisle invited me uh, and my wife, Karen, uh, to the staff party uh, that night, which was a com- totally unforgettable experience. And, you know, if I hadn't already felt a part of the team then, I really felt a part of the team uh, as a result of that. 
Um, just so many things that happened, so many wonderful memories. And, and you know, I, I guess if you're the broadcaster for Alabama football like Eli Gold or, or the Yankees uh, <laughs> back in the day, you know, when you're doing it every year, then maybe it doesn't uh, – it, or, or the Patriots, you know, winning Super Bowls, it doesn't necessarily – uh, feel as special but man when uh, when it happens and certainly when it happens for the first time uh, there's no experience like it yeah that's one of the things um, Chuck I'm still waiting to uh, experience um, a, a, cha- a championship game which as you mentioned I mean that's what all of us uh, you know really strive to have that opportunity so far uh, a Wes Welker punt return and a crab tree catch have been the highlights of what I've been able to experience but hey maybe there's there's still time right there absolutely is time. And there always, there, you know what? There's always time until there's not time. Right? <laughs> oh, we we got to write that one down. <laughs> you know, and I'm curious because I, th- I think this. Um, some people may think this goes without saying, but I think it. I think it actually needs to be said, and that is the difference because you've done both now. You've done national broadcasts um, with Westwood One and, um, you know, college football. You've done college football broadcasts. You've done college basketball broadcasts um, nationally, and it's it's something that, you know, you, you get excited about. That's all great. Um, but, man, when it's your team that's out there, there's so much investment that we have and the passion, I mean, it, it's interesting, on a previous episode, I spoke with Brad Sham, and he brought your name up, and he goes, uh, he goes, you know, there's one guy, Chuck Cooperstein, that, you know, he's so passionate about everything that he does, sometimes he jumps in so quick uh, with all of his passion, I, I feel like, I'm, I don't know if the guy's going to make it to the end of the broadcast, but he <laughs> always does, and part of that, I think, especially with you and the Mavericks, is the investment you know, that you have in, and the passion just carries through. I mean, big difference, isn't there, between national stuff that you're not so much tied to and your own team? Well, yeah, just because of that. Because, you you know, until COVID hit, we were always traveling with the team and we were embedded with that team. Uh, we were, you know, allowed to watch practice and be involved, uh, you know, at shoot arounds. And you know, you're, you're arriving with the team at two o'clock in the morning to the to the next city or whatever it is. And I you know you're just bumping into them in the lobby of the hotel. Uh, there, there's always that feeling. You're, you're around them and you're somehow a part of them, even if you're really not a part of them, because all you're doing really is chronicling what is happening. Which is why, you know, I was. Uh, even that uh, you know that I I received the championship ring in 2011 because I didn't coach I didn't play I didn't manage I didn't train but I you know I was obviously uh, able to d- describe the exploits of that season and uh, it was obviously extraordinarily special uh, to be able to 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 own that and be given one and I'll never forget the night that. Uh, that I did get the ring. Uh, you know, I like to think that I can put sentences together pretty well. And uh, it so happened that they brought the ring up uh, after the, the players had gotten theirs on the floor. Uh, they brought it up uh, in, the, in a timeout uh, between the first and second quarters. And, you know, I was not expecting it. I mean, I knew I was getting one because I had been sized for one, but I didn't know when I was going to get it. I did not expect it that night. And literally for the next 15 minutes, I was a blithering, blabbering idiot. Uh, I, could not <laughs> put, I could not put words together. And all, and all Brad with Brad over there, just as, as deadpan as Brad could be, just saying, Chuck got his ring. Chuck got his ring. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and so yeah, and so, so so you have all that all that the, the, the emotional investment that that goes with it. But but to me, Brian, it, it, regardless if I'm doing uh, a Mavericks game or if I was doing a national game, you know, it was always about the game because those people were putting the time and effort into it, and therefore I felt an obligation and feel an obligation. To, to always put the time and effort into it uh, to make people understand why this is important and and why they should listen. I mean, yeah. if, if we come across as a very laissez-faire and blasé about yeah. the whole thing and you know don't show that passion, well, okay, somebody's going to push the button and just go someplace else. I mean, I've got to bring you in and hopefully keep you in. Okay, so I, you know, 
I think it's okay if, if I say this and ask this question in this way uh, because I'm a screamer. People call me a screamer. I would classify you as a screamer. Yeah, so um, here's my question. You know, I've had times where late in a game, I'll use the 2008 game as an example um, with Crabtree, had a little bit of a cold going into it. Uh, it was a pretty close game all through a very exciting number one team in the country. I get to the end, and man, I had to push it to get that voice out. I'm curious uh, if you have any kind of techniques or any you know things you do uh, in the background to make sure that that passion you have in the first quarter is sounding the same when you get into a wild game fourth quarter. No, because you know it, it's funny. <laughs> I'll never forget. I did a I did a Texas Tech Oklahoma basketball game in 2001 for uh, for ESPN Creative, uh, you know, which was the, uh, the the regional rights holder at the time. And I'll never forget the first play of the game, the very first play of the game. It's a it's a back tap, and the 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 Tech guard and I can't remember who it was. He throws about a he throws about a 45 foot lob that is caught and dunked. And I just go nuts. I mean, it was just an absolutely spectacular play. And the uh, the producer in my ear goes, whoa, fella, whoa, we still have 39 and a half minutes to go with this. And, <laughs> and he could not have been more wrong, quite frankly, because you never know when the best play of the game will be. Mm-hmm. And, and you should always be able to rise – uh, to the spectacular moment. I mean, don't undersell it. I mean, it was real. Um, so uh, I, I just sort of go along uh, and just and just know that every possession matters. Uh, every part of the game matters. And, you know, hopefully it all winds up. And I think we all fall into this category, you know, whether it, you know, obviously we want our teams to win. But from a broadcast standpoint, the thing that we're looking for most is a great game of five minutes to go. (laughs) That's really all we're looking for uh, and and love to be able to tell the story of that. But, uh, you know, I've I've had moments uh, where, uh, you know, my throat has not had it. And, uh, you know, I I can barely get to that level that you you need to be able to get to. Um, I can remember, you know, a couple of games in Toronto specifically, and I don't know why I would always get sick in Toronto because I love Toronto. <laughs> but, I would, <laughs> but I would get I, something would happen there, and my voice would just not uh, would not cooperate. And fortunately, I know in, in at least a couple of those games, uh, the game wasn't very good, so there really wasn't that much to get excited about. So I was able to sort of fight my way through it. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's interesting because you're right about that. If, it, if it's one of those games where sometimes the game helps you out, right? And yes. I guess that's, that's the instance there. And, and I've certainly fallen into that situation too. And what about, what about where you um, are perched in basketball? I, I've always thought, uh, so I've done some basketball. I did basketball a little bit for SMU back in the day when I was working in television at Channel 8 in Dallas. I did um, tech basketball on television, which is a whole other question I wanted to ask you about, just the, 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 the radio side of things versus you know the television broadcast side of things, but also uh, the perch that you have and the differences between sports. So we got a lot of things to, to, to chat about here um, from a play-by-play perspective. So you have been courtside. You have been up into the rafters a little bit. Um, in football, we're up in the rafters for sure. Uh, never down on the sideline unless you're the sideline guy, right? So right. Uh, from a basketball perspective and what you've been through in that regard, before we get to the COVID thing, that's another subject, uh, <laughs> rafters, uh, side Side, you know, sideline. What 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 has been your preference? What's the difference for you? Well, I, I would much rather sit courtside if I can. Uh, there are very few places in the NBA left where that happens. Uh, we have it in, in Phoenix. We have it in Chicago. Um, and I think that they are the only two now where we're on the front row. Uh, mm-hmm. In Detroit and Toronto, uh, we're in the, we're in the second row. But every place else now, we're off the floor. Mm-hmm. Um, it's uh, it's disappointing, quite frankly, uh, just because I think you, especially with a game that's I think fairly intimate, like basketball, uh, the closer you are, the more you can hear, the more you can um, 
you know, just sort of take in the whole experience. It's easier to do that when you're on the floor mm -hmm. as opposed to when you're off the floor. Um, you know, I, I, I fought it for a long time, but, uh, you know, I realized the ship has now sailed and, you know, real estate is real estate and that's why things are done uh, the way they're done. Um, but, uh, it, it doesn't make it better. Uh, I, the, the downside of working on the floor is when your head coach stands in front of you the entire game, which yeah. Rick Carlisle would do <laughs> <laughs> almost all the time. So you're kind of almost always peeking around and sometimes the monitor that you have courtside or the camera angle like in phoenix phoenix has a really high stationary camera and so the 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 look that you get is not as good as say uh if you were doing it uh from the american airlines center stationary camera mm -hmm. uh, so uh therefore you, you know you're always to me i, I want to call the game live as much as i can call the game live uh, but sometimes the coach makes it difficult to do that and uh but but you work around that and i'd still rather have that uh, you know, and especially if there's a, if something has happened on the floor and we're in a timeout and the referees are there and you can talk to the referees and they can explain things to you. You know, if you're in the uh, if you're in, uh, you know, where we are in most buildings, you, you can't get that anymore. And and I also think, quite frankly, that it has led to uh, a, a lack of rapport for us uh, mm -hmm. with the officials. Uh, and, you know, in basketball, I know there are people who say, you know, one of the biggest problems in the NBA is that everybody knows who the officials are. Well, to me, it's always important to know who the officials are because they're just as important to the, to the product as the game, as, mm -hmm. as the players and the coaches. I mean, you know who they are. Why shouldn't you know who the officials are? Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it, it used to be that they would know us and they could come over and, and would come over and talk to us. But now, you know, the combination of us being off the floor with the rapid turnover of officials in the NBA, you know, leads to a much less personal relationship. And, um, and I think it, it, in many ways, and I don't think it's affected me that much, but I think it's affected others, that, you know, they're more, more than willing to go after officials and, mm -hmm. you know, just say, just say whatever they're going to say. Um, and, you know, it used to be, too, and that the NBA would provide a camp and they actually had this camp for, for the referees uh, prior to the start of the season. And uh, the broadcasters would be brought in for at least part of that camp yeah. just so that we could get some face time with the officials. And we don't get that anymore. And that's, I think that's been very unfortunate. And I think, yeah, that's, we, again, that's all, that's all part of being on the floor. You know, off the yeah. floor, uh, most of the time, you know, we, we, have, uh, we have a little more space to, to spread out and, and be comfortable uh, doing what we're doing, but uh, a lot in, in a lot of cases now that's not the case. So you know, to me, if, if we're going to be uncomfortable, <laughs> I might as well be uncomfortable <laughs> on the floor and feel like I'm in a space capsule as opposed to being off the floor. Well, and and as opposed to being in a uh, in a locker room, um, where <laughs> and by by the way, we the the Big Twelve, the football uh, officialing uh, officials had that same kind of a camp, and we were brought into it. They quit doing that too. I, I think right before COVID, which was unfortunate. But back to the locker room. Okay, so the COVID. You know, we talked um, I've, just about everybody that I've talked to so far in uh, broadcast booth series um, has had some kind of an experience, obviously, through the COVID year. Some of them have been uh, relatively similar. Um, a couple of the football uh, Big 12 guys that I've talked to so far had the similar experience we did where we kind of got into a little bubble with the team and either traveled with them to a game. But we were almost always in a broadcast booth somewhere. That was not the situation um, for for you and for for your guys. Boy, describe from a play by play's perspective. You just talked about how how you know you'd love to be courtside. Uh, sometimes you're in the rafters, but then you're in a locker room watching it on a monitor. What the heck was that like? Well, the locker room was actually good compared to what we wound up with uh, this year uh, during the regular season. We. Uh, we had uh, at the beginning of this. The, well, let's go backwards. The locker room is where we did the games last year uh, when the bubble resumed, and uh, and we did our playoff games from there. Well, we couldn't do it from the locker room this year because mm -hmm. the games were actually being played at home. So they had to find different places uh, for for us to operate. Now, at least for the for the home games, we would do the home games from where we've always done it. 
uh, in our regular perch. Uh, mm -hmm. But for the road games, we started out uh, on the Mavericks practice floor, uh, which was which was okay. And then they decided that they didn't want us there, and uh, they had to create space for both uh, television and radio. And and we were moved into a 10 by 16 foot room just off of where <laughs> the players would come in. And we had, we had two big tables. I mean, and there was plenty of room to spread out and there were two monitors, you know, one of which was the, the clean feed and the other uh, was uh, the, the, the television feed so I could get the graphics uh, that they were showing. Um, but uh, you know, it's, it's hard floors and hard ceilings and uh, cinder block walls and, you know, we wound up, you know, trying to put up some blankets and whatnot to try to deaden the sound. <laughs> but I'll never forget, uh, I mean, pretty early on, once we made the move into into this room that uh, I'm doing my pregame interview with uh, with Rick Carlisle, <laughs> and Carlisle just says to me, where the hell are you, man? I said, you in the back of the movie van? <laughs> and I had to, well, yeah, those are moving van blankets, but we are. We're actually in the building, uh, so you know. And, and then you're you're subject as well to, uh, you know, not just watching the game and you know being at a slave to the director and what he's showing, uh, as opposed to having the full view of the floor, which you know, as it relates certainly to substitutions and whatnot, uh, is really important. You're you're not yeah. seeing that until way too late, uh, but but also, um, you know, you're you're just. Uh, not getting the, the feel of the crowd because of w whatever is being fed to you uh, or, or not being fed to you. We, we, I mean, we had one game early in the year against Houston where literally we had no sound. We had hmm. nothing. We had, I mean, literally it was, it was Brad's voice and my voice. And it was brutal. It was, it was, a, it was a horrible broadcast. The, uh, the, the road games became, I think, much more difficult to do. Uh, over time, uh, just because of you, you never knew what kind of mix you were going to get. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, my, my engineer, uh, Bill Geiger, and, and also Ken Mendez, they're fantastic. They're the best, as far as I'm concerned, in, in, in giving me you know, the, 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 the mix that I need, the sound that I want, uh, in, in order to bring out the excitement of the game. Uh, but they're, uh, they could only be as good as what they were being fed. And there were a lot of nights where they weren't being fed a lot. So that, that became rather problematic, to say the least. Yeah, you know, the only thing I can even relate to, to, to that is, uh, you know, there are a couple of booths in the Big 12 that are closed. And they don't have any window opening access to the mm -hmm. outside world. And uh, our producer engineer, Steve Pitts, who um, has been, he's been with me since I've done the broadcast. He was with Jack Dale Pryor and uh, has obviously been through the rope. So he's figured out ways at almost every stadium to get an outside microphone out there to at least allow us to pick something up. But like you said, during the COVID situation, when there was nobody in the stands or very few at the, you know, in a couple of places, it just, it sounds like you're in a box, which I guess we kind of are in a broadcast booth in a box, but um, it sounded like that. And man, you hate that. Yes. You, you, you but, hate to sound hollow, right? Yeah. You know, it, it's funny because you know, obviously I had a, a very uh, fortunate moment when uh, Luka Doncic hit the, the, the shot in game four against the Clippers last year. Uh, you know, to win the game, tie the series, big shot, big moment, pretty good call, I think. And then, uh, you know, I went back and listened to it, and it's like, you could tell I was in a room. You could tell the sound was bouncing around, and it's just not what it should have been. But, hey, it's it's what we had to live with. It was still a great call, man. It was a great call. <laughs> Thank you. Don't kid yourself. It was a great call. <laughs> Uh, and hey, this is a great moment. I'm gonna for those of you on podcast. I, I'm showing on the screen on the YouTube channel. Um, talk of the town. This is uh, something that uh, Chuck, you've been involved in for quite a while, um, and it's I think obviously very cool. But the the great play by play guys. We've been so fortunate in the Dallas Fort Worth market to have some of the great professionals that do play by here play here for the professional sports. Uh, talk, talk a little bit about this and, and, and how it came about, because I know it's dear to your heart. Well, uh, it, it came about because uh, I was doing a Cowboys, actually the only Cowboys game I've ever done in my life. <laughs> uh, 
I did the Cowboys Broncos game the year that uh, Romo threw for 500 yards, and it was that it was like a 51 48 game it was crazy. And they uh, Westwood One asked me to do that game because I was doing some NFL for them at the time, and they had added that game to their package. So I, so I did that game. So I'm on the field before the game with Brad, and then Eric is also on the field. He's brought some a friend of his from Cuba uh, to, to watch the game. And uh, from that, uh, Brad, it's, I think it's at some point just said, where's Ralph? You know, because Ralph Stanis <laughs> was the play by play voice of the stars, and he was the only one of the four that was not there. And that kind of led to um, uh, us uh, thinking about, uh, you know, get, you know getting, getting the four of us together. And so the four of us, uh, so we, you know, tried to figure out a time when the four of us might have a day, uh, given our respective schedules. And we found one and uh, we went over to Eric's house and uh, our, our wives and significant others were there, too. And uh, we were just having a blast. And then my wife, uh, Karen, who is uh, uh, who, who in her uh, many and many varied roles is a, is a fundraiser and has been involved with charities and, and knew how to know how to raise money uh, like nobody's business said, you realize she's listened to all these stories and saying, you realize people would pay to hear this, right? So that was the genesis of talk of the town, which, uh, which we did for three years and we each had our own charities and you know, mine obviously was Scottish, right? And I'm really proud of that. And we raised a lot of money for them. And, um, you know, we haven't done it uh, the last couple of years. Things have, uh, you know, just moved in a, in a different direction, but, uh, but it was great. It, it was really, really a, a wonderful, wonderful experience. And I think the people who attended uh, those uh, had a uh, had a great time and uh, really got a, a sense of you know, not just our business, but a sense of us, too. Well, and there's no doubt that uh, there is a uh, uh, there, there's like a uh, fraternity, if you will, um, with with broadcasters around the country, uh, especially those that I think, you know, work in the same market or maybe work in the same conference or that type of thing mm -hmm. where you, you know, you, you run into each other quite often. Obviously, if you're in a conference or in a, um, you know, in a, a league, you run into them every year, at least a couple of times or more. But boy, the, the camaraderie that you guys have as being a Dallas Fort Worth group that has been together, um, you say, I say together, I mean, <laughs> you've done your own thing in your own sport, but here in the Dallas Fort Worth market, you've been together for so many years now. Um, I'm the baby. It's just, I'm, yeah, I'm, you are. You know, I'm not. Yeah. You know, Brad. You know, Eric's. Uh, Eric is. I know well over forty years with, with the with the Rangers, and I think Brad. You know, I know Brad. Uh, you know, as the play by play guy, started in '84, but he was, I think, eight years with Vern prior to mm -hmm. that. Uh, you know, I'm only 16 years into this. I mean, I've been in the market a long time, but I'm only 16 years in with the Mavericks. So yeah, I'm a I'm a literal child compared to them. Okay, well, but I know there's more. Uh, there are more passions involved in your world. In fact, I think I think the times that I got to know you most um, back when I was doing television in the Dallas Fort Worth market was when you were doing this other passion of yours, golf, <laughs> uh, because we would play in like the pro ams of the Col or not. It was a media day, right? Uh, right. At the at the Colonial open. or the Byron Nelson or whatever. And man, those were blasts. Is still that other passion of yours? Uh, it is, uh, I'm just not as good as I was. It's just, it's, <laughs> I don't, it's, it's a, it's age and it's, it's, you know, other things kind of getting in the way. I'm not playing as much as I really want to, but, uh, but I, I do love getting out there. Uh, there's, you know, there's still nothing quite like a perfectly flush four iron. Okay. That's <laughs> when, okay, when you wait, wait, sweet. wait, 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 a perfectly flushed four iron. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I've never experienced that. <laughs> um, I mean, every, well, at one time in my life, I could do that. It, it happens far more infrequently now, but when it does, it's really, really sweet. Yeah. I think the perfectly flush that I've had is maybe like a pitching wedge or something. <laughs> Those long irons, are give, they give me such grief. Uh, okay, here's the other one that I found that I thought was uh, kind of fun and interesting. NBA Eats, the Instagram NBA that you started. Eats. And, uh, NBA, man. Again, again, that was uh, that's a product of uh, of my wife, uh, who has uh, has much more creative thoughts than I do, <laughs> quite frankly. <And> that's <laughs> probably why I'm, it's probably why I'm still with her. But uh, 
but basically what we decided to do is because when you're on the road you're in all these different cities it's like uh you know you need to sh need to show them you know where you're eating and what you're doing and you know, obviously <laughs> everybody has certain foods that they like and i know the one the, in the top left is uh, i i don't know that anyone uh, in in the NBA or certainly in college sports that's that's been to Indianapolis uh, for the Final Four or uh, Big Ten Championship or, wh or whatever, uh, a trip to St. Elmo's is oh, an yeah. absolute must, and to eat yeah. their shrimp cocktail is an absolute must because there is there is no sauce in the world like it, and uh, it is the most horseradishy spicy <laughs> clean out your senses uh cocktail sauce that has ever been created and i can't wait for the schedule to come out next year and we and we always hope and uh, in fact uh, the last time uh we were in indianapolis we were on the second of a back-to-back -back and saint almost is closed oh. saint almost, so you, so we couldn't go but but you need to be resourceful. There's always there's always a way around it. Uh, the people who own a St. Elmo's also own a place called Harry and Izzy's, and Harry and Izzy's yes. is open for lunch. So therefore, we, nice. we, we got it for lunch on the day of the game. Nice. Yeah, you know, as I was telling you earlier, having struggles sometimes with uh, you know the voice hanging in there. If you go to St. Elmo's first. Get it all. Get that sinus all cleared out. <laughs> <laughs> you will. There is no question. It's, it's phenomenal. But yeah, uh, you know, there are so many places that you know, like when we go to Memphis and we go to Rendezvous, you know, or um, you know, we go, uh, you know, in 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 New York. I was lucky enough one night to, to go to uh, the Great Steakhouse Benjamin Prime. Uh, you know, you go to Boston. And, uh, you know, Giordano's uh, in the North End is like, that's some of my favorite Italian in the world. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, the 4th Street Deli, the 4th Street Deli in Philadelphia, which is one of the great Jewish delis uh, in, in the country. And, you know, I, I like my corned beef and pastrami. So that's, uh, you know, that, that, that becomes a must. And, um, and, and the thing is, is that, you know, being around, you know, the guys in the league for as now as long as I've been, you know, they have their favorites too. So, yeah. you know, so you go and you check that out and then you go put it up there and it's it's had a it, it's it's been fun to do I, and but basically you know peek behind the curtain i just take the pictures and i eat and karen writes and, and i write the copy <laughs> and karen just posts it you know with a few edits in there <laughs> hey it's teamwork <laughs> there you go <laughs> that, that works out great i, I think the, the the favorite for me um so i used to work for the with a company that was based in chicago so i was in chicago a lot and I love Lou Malnati's pizza. And so yeah. mm -hmm. uh, uh, last year, I noticed online that uh, they were they were shipping all around the country with with some other things that you could get, Garrett's popcorn, that kind of thing. And so right. I was like, I told my wife, I was like, um, I don't think you've ever had Lou Malnati's. I'm going to have it shipped. And I'll be darned if it wasn't really good showing up on the doorstep. I thought, okay, you know, day or two, it's not going to be that good. It was fabulous. So there are yeah, still exactly. ways to get I, it, you know? <laughs> yes. I, I need to correct myself because I think I said Giordano's in Boston. Giordano's is in Chicago. See, that's a competitor of yes. the Manatis that, uh, yes. that I love. But ah. it's Giacomo's in, in Boston, in the North End, on Hanover Street. And, uh, yes, I, I can pretty much walk to it uh, without needing a map to get there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty much the same way with a lot of places that we go to, too. So, uh, hey, listen uh, – Chuck, I really appreciate the, the, the opportunity to, to chat play-by-play -play with you and hopefully bring some people into what goes on in those headsets of yours other than what they necessarily hear that's happening on the court. I appreciate you having me, Brian. It's great to see you again. All right. Well, thank you for that. Uh, you know, Chuck Cooperstein, as we mentioned, one of the great play-by-play uh, -play voices in the country. Dallas Mavericks, uh, his home at the moment. As mentioned, he's done so many other things prior, and I'm sure will again as he goes forward in his career. Uh, we hope to uh, entertain you with some other names that are coming up. Vern Lundquist is going to be on an episode coming up soon. Uh, we'll have some other Big 12 football play-by-play -play guys as well. That's coming up as the broadcast booth stories inside the headsets of play-by-play -play continue. And very quick reminder for those of you uh, that are following us or that haven't started following the series completely yet, uh, you can get to the information about all of our series right here on all of the different social media platforms. So please be sure to check them out, subscribe, and enjoy, hopefully. 
what's coming up later. 